Book Three, Part Two of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Next in order will follow melody and song. Well, that is obvious. Every one can see already what we ought to say about them if we are to be consistent with ourselves. I fear," said Glaucon, laughing, "that the word "every one" hardly includes me for I cannot at the moment say what they should be, though I may guess. At any rate, you can tell that a song or ode has three parts, the words, the melody, and the rhythm. That degree of knowledge I may presuppose. Yes, he said, so much as that you may. And as for the words, there will surely be no difference between words which are and which are not set to music. Both will conform to the same laws, and these have been already determined by us, yes, and the melody and rhythm will depend upon the words, certainly. We were saying, when we spoke of the subject matter, that we had no need of lamentation and strains of sorrow. True. And which are the harmonies expressive of sorrow? You are musical and can tell me. The harmonics which you mean are the mixed or tenor Lydian, and the full-toned or bass Lydian, and such like. These, then, I said, must be banished, even to women who have a character to maintain they are of no use, and much less to men. Certainly. In the next place, drunkenness and softness and indolence are utterly unbecoming the character of our guardians. Utterly unbecoming. And which are the soft or drinking harmonies? The Ionian he replied, and the Lydian. They are termed relaxed. Well, and are these of any military use? Quite the reverse, he replied, and if so, the Dorian and the Phrygian are the only ones which you have left. I answered, of the harmonies I know nothing, but I want to have one warlike, to sound the note or accent which a brave man utters in the hour of danger and stern resolve, or when his cause is failing, and he is going to wounds or death, or is overtaken by some evil, and at every such crisis meets the blows of fortune with firm step and a determination to endure, and another to be used by him in times of peace and freedom of action, when there is no pressure of necessity, and he is seeking to persuade God by prayer, or man by instruction and admonition, or on the other hand, when he is expressing his willingness to yield to persuasion or entreaty or admonition, and which presents him when by prudent conduct he has attained his end, not carried away by his success, but acting moderately and wisely under the circumstances and acquiescing in the event. These two harmonies I ask you to leave, the strain of necessity, the strain of courage, and the strain of temperance. These, I say, leave. And these, he replied, are the Dorian and Phrygian harmonies of which I was just now speaking. Then, I said, if these and these only are to be used in our songs and melodies, we shall not want multiplicity of notes or panharmonic scale. I suppose not. Then we shall not maintain the artificers of lyres with three corners and complex scales, or the makers of any other many-stringed, curiously harmonized instruments? Certainly not. But what do you say to flute-makers and flute-players? Would you admit them into our state when they reflect that in this composite use of harmony the flute is worse than all the stringed instruments put together? Even the panharmonic music is only an imitation of the flute? Clearly not. There remain then only the lyre and the harp for use in the city and the shepherds may have a pipe in the country. That is surely the conclusion to be drawn from the argument. The preferring of Apollo and his instruments is not at all strange, I said. Not at all, he replied. And so, by the dog of Egypt, we have been unconsciously purging the state, which not long ago we termed luxurious. And we have done wisely, he replied. Then let us now finish the purgation, I said. Next, in order to harmonies, rhythms will naturally follow, and they should be subject to the same rules, for we ought not to seek out complex systems of meter or meters of every kind, 
but rather to discover what rhythms are the expressions of a courageous and harmonious life, and when we have found them, we shall adapt the foot and the melody to words having a like spirit, not the words to the foot and the melody. To say what these rhythms are will be your duty. You must teach me, then, as you have already taught me the harmonics. But, indeed, he replied, I cannot tell you. I only know that there are some three principles of rhythm out of which metrical systems are framed, just as in sounds there are four notes, that is, the four notes of the tetrachord, out of which all the harmonies are composed. That is an observation which I have made, but, but of what sort of lives they are severally the imitations, I am unable to say. Then, I said, we must take Damon into our councils, and he will tell us what rhythms are expressive of meanness, or insolence, or fury, or other unworthiness, and what are to be reserved for the expression of opposite feelings. And I think that I have an indistinct recollection of his mentioning a complex cretic rhythm, also a dactylic or heroic, and he arranged them in some manner which I do not quite understand, making the rhythms equal in the rise and the fall of the foot, long and short alternating, and, unless I am mistaken, he spoke of an iambic as well as a trochaic rhythm, and assigned to them short and long quantities. Also, in some cases, he appeared to praise or censure the movement of the foot quite as much as the rhythm, or perhaps a combination of the two, for I am not certain what he meant. These matters, however, as I was saying, had better be deferred to Damon himself, for the analysis of the subject would be difficult, you know. Rather so, I should say. But there is no difficulty in seeing that grace, or the absence of grace, is an effect of good or bad rhythm. None at all. And also that good and bad rhythm naturally assimilate to a good and bad style, and that harmony and discord in like manner follow style, for our principle is that rhythm and harmony are regulated by the words, and not the words by them. Just so, he said, they should follow the words. And will not the words and the character of the style depend on the temper of the soul? Yes. And everything else on the style? Yes. Then beauty of style and harmony and grace and good rhythm depend on simplicity. I mean the true simplicity of a rightly and nobly ordered mind and character, not that other simplicity, which is only a euphemism for folly. Very true, he replied. And if our youth are to do their work in life, must they not make these graces and harmonies their perpetual aim? They must. And surely the art of the painter and every other creative and constructive art are full of them, weaving, embroidery, architecture, and every kind of manufacture, also nature, animal and vegetable. In all of them there is a grace or the absence of grace, and ugliness and discord and inharmonious motion are nearly allied to ill words and ill nature, as grace and harmony are the twin sisters of goodness and virtue, and bear their likeness. That is quite true, he said. But shall our superintendents go no further, and are the poets only to be required by us to express the image of the good in their works on pain, if they do anything else, of expulsion from our state? Or is the same control to be extended to the other artists, and are they also to be prohibited from exhibiting the opposite forms of vice and intemperance and meanness and indecency, in sculpture and building and the other creative arts and is he who cannot conform to this rule of ours to be prevented from practising his art in our state lest the taste of our citizens be corrupted by him we would not have our guardians grow up amid images of moral deformity as in some noxious pasture and there browse and feed upon many a baneful herb and flower day by day little by little until they silently gather a festering mass of corruption in their own soul. Let our artists rather be those who are gifted to discern the true nature of the beautiful and graceful. Then will our youth dwell in a land of wealth, and amid fair sights and sounds, and receive the good in everything, and beauty, the affluence of fair works, 
shall flow into the eye and ear like a health-giving breeze from a purer region, and insensibly draw the soul from earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason. There can be no nobler training than that, he replied. And therefore, I said, Glaucon, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other, because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul, on which they mightily fasten, imparting grace, and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful, or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful, and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature, and with a true taste, while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good, and becomes noble and good, he will justly blame and hate the bad, now in the days of his youth, even before he is able to know the reason why. And when reason comes, he will recognize and salute the friend with whom his education has made him long familiar. Yes, he said, I quite agree with you in thinking that our youth should be trained in music, and on the grounds which you mention. Just as in learning to read, I said, we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet, which are very few, in all their recurring sizes and combinations, not slighting them as unimportant whether they occupy a space large or small, but everywhere eager to make them out, and not thinking ourselves perfect in the art of reading until we recognize them wherever they are found. True. Or as we recognize the reflection of letters in the water or in a mirror, only when we know the letters themselves, the same art and study giving us the knowledge of both. Exactly. Even so, as I maintain, neither we nor our guardians, whom we have to educate, can ever become musical until we and they know the essential forms of temperance, courage, liberality, magnificence, and their kindred, as well as the contrary forms in all their combinations, and can recognize them and their images wherever they are found, not slighting them either in small things or great, but believing them all to be within the sphere of what art and study. Most assuredly. And when a beautiful soul harmonizes with a beautiful form, and the two are cast in one mould, that will be the fairest of sights to him who has an eye to see it. The fairest indeed, and the fairest is also the loveliest. Well, that may be assumed. And the man who has the spirit of harmony will be most in love with the loveliest, but he will not love him who is of an inharmonious soul. That is true, he replied if the deficiency be in his soul, but if there be any merely bodily defect in another, he will be patient of it, and will love all the same. I perceive, I said, that you have or have had experiences of this sort, and I agree. But let me ask you another question. Has excess of pleasure any affinity to temperance? How can that be? he replied. Pleasure deprives a man of the use of his faculties quite as much as pain. Or any affinity to virtue in general? None whatever. Any affinity to wantonness and intemperance? Yes, the greatest. And is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love? No, nor a madder. Whereas true love is a love of beauty and order, temperate and temperate and harmonious? Quite true he said. Then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love? Well, certainly not. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort. No, indeed, Socrates, it must never come near them. Then I suppose that in the city which we are founding you could make a law to the effect that a friend should use no other familiarity to his love than a father would use to his son, and then only for a noble purpose, and he must first have the other's consent. And this rule is to limit him in all his intercourse, and he is never to be seen going further, or if he exceeds, he is to be deemed guilty of coarseness and bad taste. I quite agree, he said this much of music which makes a fair ending for what should be the end of music if not the love of beauty i agree he said 
After music comes gymnastic, in which our youth are next to be trained. Certainly. Gymnastic, as well as music, should begin in early years. The training in it should be careful and should continue through life. Now, my belief is, and this is a matter upon which I should like to have your opinion in confirmation of my own, but my own belief is not that the good body by any bodily excellence improves the soul, but on the contrary, that the good soul, by her own excellence, improves the body as far as this may be possible. What do you say? Yes, I agree. Then to the mind, when adequately trained, we shall be right in handing over the more particular care of the body, and in order to avoid prolixity, we will now only give the general outlines of the subject. Very good. That they must abstain from intoxication has been already remarked by us, for of all persons a guardian should be the last to get drunk and not know where in the world he is. Yes, he said, that a guardian should require another guardian to take care of him is ridiculous indeed. But next, what shall we say of their food? For the men are in training for the great contest of all, are they not? Yes, he said. And will the habit of body of our ordinary athletes be suited to them? Well, why not? I am afraid, I said, that a habit of body such as they have is but a sleepy sort of thing and rather perilous to health. Do you not observe that these athletes sleep away their lives, and are liable to most dangerous illnesses if they depart, in ever so slight a degree, from their customary regimen? Yes, I do. Then, I said, a finer sort of training will be required for our warrior athletes, who are to be like wakeful dogs, and to see and hear with the utmost keenness amid the many changes of water and also of food, of summer heat and winter cold, which they will have to endure when on a campaign, they must be liable to break down in health. That is my view. The really excellent gymnastic is twin sister of that simple music which we were just now describing. How so? Why, I conceive that there is a gymnastic which, like our music, is simple and good, and especially the military gymnastic. What do you mean? My meaning may be learned from Homer. He, you know, feeds his heroes at their feasts, where they are campaigning on soldiers' fare. They have no fish, although they are on the shores of the Hellespont, and they are not allowed boiled meats, but only roast, which is the food most convenient for soldiers, requiring only that they should light a fire, and not involving the trouble of carrying about pots and pans. True and I can hardly be mistaken in saying that sweet sauces are nowhere mentioned in Homer. In proscribing them, however, he is not singular. All professional athletes are well aware that a man who is to be in good condition should take nothing of the kind. Yes, he said, and knowing this, they are quite right in not taking them. Then you would not approve of the Syracusan dinners and the refinements of Sicilian cookery? I think not. Nor, if a man is to be in condition, would you allow him to have a Corinthian girl as his fair friend? Certainly not. Neither would you approve of the delicacies, as they are thought, of Athenian confectionery? Certainly not. All such feeding and living may be rightly compared by us to melody and song, composed in the panharmonic style, and in all the rhythms. Exactly. There complexity engendered license, and here disease. Whereas simplicity in music was the parent of temperance in the soul, and simplicity in gymnastic of health in the body. Most true, he said. But when intemperance and diseases multiply in a state, calls of justice and medicine are always being opened, and the arts of the doctor and the lawyer give themselves airs, finding how keen is the interest which not only the slaves but the free men of the city take about them. Of course. And yet, what greater proof can there be of a bad and disgraceful state of education than this, that not only artisans and the meaner sort of people need the skill of first-rate physicians and judges, but also those who would profess to have had a liberal education? Is it not disgraceful, and a great sign of want of good breeding, that a man should have to go abroad for his law and physic because he has none of his own at home, 
and must therefore surrender himself into the hands of other men whom he makes lords and judges over him of all things he said the most disgraceful would you say most i replied when you consider that there is a further stage of the evil in which a man is not only a lifelong litigant passing all his days in the courts either as plaintiff or defendant but is actually led by his bad taste to pride himself on his litigiousness he imagines that he is a master of dishonesty able to take every crooked turn and wriggle into and out of every hole bending like a withy and getting out of the way of justice and a hole for what in order to gain small points not worth mentioning he not knowing that so to order his life as to be able to do without a napping judge is a far higher and nobler sort of thing is not that still more disgraceful yes he said that is still more disgraceful well i said and to require the help of medicine not when a wound has to be cured or on occasion of an epidemic but just because by indolence and a habit of life such as we have been describing men fill themselves with waters and winds as if their bodies were a marsh compelling the ingenious sons of asclepius to find more names for diseases such as flatulence and catarrh is not this too a disgrace yes he said they do certainly give very strange and new-fangled names to diseases yes i said and i do not believe that there were any such diseases in the days of asclepius and this i infer from the circumstance that the hero eurypylus after he has been wounded in homer drinks a posset of pramnian wine well besprinkled with barley meal and grated cheese which are certainly inflammatory and yet the sons of asclepius who were at the trojan war do not blame the damsel who gives him the drink or rebuke patroclus who is treating his case well he said that was surely an extraordinary drink to be given to a person in his condition not so extraordinary i replied if you bear in mind that in former days as is commonly said before the time of herodicus the guild of asclepius did not practise our present system of medicine which may be said to educate diseases but herodicus being a trainer and himself of a sickly constitution by a combination of training and doctoring found out a way of torturing first and chiefly himself and secondly the rest of the world how was that he said by the intervention of lingering death for he had a mortal disease which he perpetually tended and as recovery was out of the question he passed his entire life as a valetudinarian he could do nothing but attend upon himself and he was in constant torment whenever he departed in anything from his usual regimen and so dying hard by the help of science he struggled on to old age a rare reward for his skill yes i said a reward which a man might fairly expect who never understood that if asclepius did not instruct his descendants in valetudinarian hearts the omission arose not from ignorance or inexperience of such a branch of medicine but because he knew that in all well-ordered states every individual has an occupation to which he must attend and has therefore no leisure to spend in continually being ill this we remark in the case of the artisan but ludicrously enough do not apply the same rule to people of the richer sort how do you mean he said i mean this when a carpenter is ill he asks the physician for a rough and ready cure an emetic or purge or a cautery or the knife these are his remedies and if someone prescribes for him a course of dietetics and tells him that he must swathe and swaddle his head and all that sort of thing he replies at once that he has no time to be ill and that he sees no good in a life which is spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his customary employment and therefore bidding good-bye to this sort of physician he resumes his ordinary habits and either gets well and lives and does his business or if his constitution fails he dies and has no more trouble yes he said and a man in his condition of life ought to use the art of medicine thus far only has he not i said an occupation and what profit would there be in his life if he were deprived of his occupation quite true he said but with a rich man this is otherwise 
of him we do not say that he has any specially appointed work which he must perform if he would live he is generally supposed to have nothing to do then you have heard of the saying of Phocyclides that as soon as a man has a livelihood he should practise virtue nay he said i think that he had better begin somewhat sooner let us not have a dispute with him about this i said but rather ask ourselves is the practice of virtue obligatory on the rich man or can he live without it and if obligatory on him then let us raise a further question whether this dieting of disorders which is an impediment to the application of the mind in carpentering and the mechanical arts does not equally stand in the way of the sentiment of Posiclides. Of that, he replied, there can be no doubt. Such excessive care of the body, when carried beyond the rules of gymnastic, is, is most inimical to the practice of virtue. Yes, indeed, I replied, and equally incompatible with the management of a house, an army, or an office of state and what is most important of all irreconcilable with any kind of study or thought or self-reflection there is a constant suspicion that headache and giddiness are to be ascribed to philosophy and hence all practising or making trial of virtue in the higher sense is absolutely stopped for a man is always fancying that he is being made ill and is in constant anxiety about the state of his body yes likely enough and therefore our politic Asclepius may be supposed to have exhibited the power of his art only to persons who, being generally of healthy constitution and habits of life, had a definite ailment, such as those he cured by purges and operations, and bade them live as usual, herein consulting the interests of the state. But bodies which disease had penetrated through and through he would not have attempted to cure by gradual processes of evacuation and infusion. He did not want to lengthen out good-for-nothing lives, or to have weak fathers begetting weaker sons. If a man was not able to live in the ordinary way, he had no business to cure him, for such a cure would have been of no use either to himself or to the state. Then, he said, you regard Asclepius as a statesman. Clearly, and his character is further illustrated by his sons. Note that they were heroes in the days of old, and practised the medicines of which I am speaking at the siege of Troy. You will remember how, when Pandarus wounded Menelaus, they sucked the blood out of the wound and sprinkled soothing remedies. But they never prescribed what the patient was afterwards to eat or drink in the case of Menelaus, any more than in the case of Eurypylus. The remedies, as they conceived, were enough to heal any man who before he was wounded was healthy and regular in his habits, and even though he did happen to drink a posset of Pramnian wine, he might get well all the same. But they would have nothing to do with unhealthy and intemperate subjects, whose lives were of no use either to themselves or others. The art of medicine was not designed for their good, and though they were as rich as Midas, the sons of Asclepius would have declined to attend them. They were very acute persons, those sons of Asclepius. Naturally so, I replied. Nevertheless, the tragedians and Pindar, disobeying our behests, although they acknowledge that Asclepius was the son of Apollo, say also that he was bribed into healing a rich man who was at the point of death, and for this reason he was struck by lightning. But we, in accordance with the principle already affirmed by us, will not believe them when they tell us both. If he was the son of a god, we maintain that he was not avaricious, or if he was avaricious, he was not the son of a god. All that, Socrates, is excellent, but I should like to put a question to you. Ought there not to be good physicians in a state, and are not the best those who have treated the greatest number of constitutions good or bad, and are not the best judges in like manner those who are acquainted with all sorts of moral natures? Yes, I said, I too would have good judges and good physicians. But do you know whom I think good? Will you tell me? I will, if I can. Let me, however, note that in the same question you join two things which are not the same. How so? he asked. Why, I said, you join physicians and judges. Now, the most skilful physicians are those who, from their youth upwards, have combined with the knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. 
they had better not be robust in health, and should have had all manner of diseases in their own persons. For the body, as I conceive, is not the instrument with which they cure the body. In that case we could not allow them ever to be or to have been sickly. But they cure the body with the mind, and the mind which has become and is sick can cure nothing. That is very true, he said. But with the judge it is otherwise, since he governs mind by mind. He ought not, therefore, to have been trained among vicious minds, and to have associated with them from youth upwards, and to have gone through the whole calendar of crime, only in order that he may quickly infer the crimes of others as he might their bodily diseases from his own self-consciousness. The honourable mind which is to form a healthy judgment should have had no experience or contamination of evil habits when young. And this is the reason why in youth good men often appear to be simple and are easily practised upon by the dishonest, because they have no examples of what evil is in their own souls. Yes, he said, they are far too apt to be deceived. Therefore, I said, the judge should not be young. He should have learned to know evil, not from his own soul, but from late and long observation of the nature of evil in others. Knowledge should be his guide, not personal experience. Yes, he said, that is the ideal of a judge. Yes, I replied, and he will be a good man, which is my answer to your question, for he is good who has a good soul. But the cunning and suspicious nature of which we spoke, he who has committed many crimes and fancies himself to be a master in wickedness, when he is amongst his fellows, is wonderful in the precautions which he takes, because he judges of them by himself. But when he gets into the company of men of virtue, who have the experience of age, he appears to be a fool again, owing to his unseasonable suspicions. He cannot recognize an honest man, because he has no pattern of honesty in himself. And at the same time, as the bad are more numerous than the good, and he meets with them oftener, he thinks himself, and is by others thought to be, rather wise than foolish. Most true, he said. Then the good and wise judge whom we are seeking is not this man, but the other. For vice cannot know virtue too, but a virtuous nature, educated by time, will acquire a knowledge both of virtue and vice. The virtuous and not the vicious man has wisdom, in my opinion, and in mine also. This is the state of medicine, and this is the sort of law which you will sanction in your state. They will minister to better natures, giving health both of soul and of body. But those who are diseased in their bodies they will leave to die, and the corrupt and incurable souls they will put an end to themselves. That is clearly the best thing both for the patients and for the state. And thus our youth, having been educated only in that simple music, which, as we said, inspires temperance, will be reluctant to go to law, clearly. And the musician, who, keeping the same track, is content to practice the simple gymnastic, will have nothing to do with medicine, unless in some extreme case. That I quite believe. The very exercises and tolls which he undergoes are intended to stimulate the spirited element of his nature, and not to increase his strength. He will not, like common athletes, use exercise and regimen to develop his muscles. Very right, he said. Neither are the two arts of music and gymnastic really designed, as is often supposed, the one for the training of the soul, the other for the training of the body. What, then, is the real object of them? I believe, I said, that the teachers of both have in view chiefly the improvement of the soul. How can that be? he asked. Did you never observe, I said, the effect on the mind itself of exclusive devotion to gymnastic, or the opposite effect of an exclusive devotion to music? In what way shown? he said. The one producing a temper of hardness and ferocity, the other of softness and effeminacy, I replied. Yes, he said, I am quite aware that the mere athlete becomes too much of a savage, and that the mere musician is melted and softened beyond what is good for him. Yet surely, I said, this ferocity only comes from spirit, which, if rightly educated, would give courage, 
but if too much intensified is liable to become hard and brutal. That I quite think. On the other hand, the philosopher will have the quality of gentleness, and this also, when too much indulged, will turn to softness, but if educated rightly, will be gentle and moderate. True. And in our opinion, the guardians ought to have both these qualities, assuredly, and both should be in harmony, beyond question. And the harmonious soul is both temperate and courageous, yes, and the inharmonious is cowardly and boorish, very true. And when a man allows music to play upon him and to pour into his soul through the funnel of his ears, those sweet and soft and melancholy airs of which we were just now speaking, and his whole life is passed in warbling and the delights of a song, in the first stage of the process the passion or spirit which is in him is tempered like iron, and made useful instead of brittle and useless. But if he carries on the softening and soothing process, in the next stage, he begins to melt and waste until he has wasted away his spirit and cut out the sinews of his soul, and he becomes a feeble warrior. Very true. If the element of spirit is naturally weak in him, the change is speedily accomplished. But if he have a good deal, then the power of music weakening the spirit renders him excitable, and the least provocation he flames up at once and is speedily extinguished. Instead of having spirit, he grows irritable and passionate, and is quite impracticable. Exactly. And so, in gymnastics, if a man takes violent exercise and is a great feeder, and the reverse of a great student of music and philosophy, at first the high condition of his body fills him with pride and spirit, and he becomes twice the man that he was. Certainly. And what happens? If he do nothing else, and holds no converse with the muses, does not even that intelligence which there may be in him, having no taste of any sort of learning or inquiry or thought or culture, grow feeble and dull and blind, his mind never waking up or receiving nourishment, and his senses not being purged of their mists? True, he said. And he ends by becoming a hater of philosophy, uncivilized, never using the weapons of persuasion. He is like a wild beast, all violence and fierceness, and knows no other way of dealing, and he lives in all ignorance and evil conditions, and has no sense of propriety and grace. That is quite true, he said. And as there are two principles of human nature, one the spirited and the other philosophical, some god, as I should say, has given mankind two arts answering to them, and only indirectly to the soul and the body, in order that these two principles, like the strings of an instrument, may be relaxed or drawn tighter until they are duly harmonized. That appears to be the intention. And he who mingles music with gymnastic in the fairest proportions, and best attempers them to the soul, may be rightly called the true musician and harmonist in a far higher sense than the tuner of the strings. You are quite right, Socrates and such a presiding genius will always be required in our state if the government is to last. Yes, he will be absolutely necessary. Such, then, are our principles of nurture and education. Where would be the use of going into further details about the dances of our citizens, or about the hunting and coursing, their gymnastic and equestrian contests? For these all follow the general principle, and having found that, we shall have no difficulty in discovering them. I dare say that there will be no difficulty. Very good, I said. But then, what is the next question? Must we not ask who are to be the rulers and who subjects? Certainly. There can be no doubt that the elder must rule the younger, clearly, and that the best of these must rule. That is also clear. Now, are not the best husbandmen those who are most devoted to husbandry? Yes. And as we are to have the best of guardians for our city, must they not be those who have the most the character of guardians? Yes. And to this end they ought to be wise and efficient, and to have a special care of the state? True. And a man will be most likely to care about that which he loves, to be sure, and he will be most likely to love that which he regards as having the same interests with himself, 
and that of which the good or evil fortune is supposed by him at any time most to affect his own? Very true, he replied. Then there must be a selection. Let us note among the guardians those who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is for the good of their country, and the greatest repugnance to do what is against her interests. Those are the right men and they will have to be watched at every age, in order that we may see whether they preserve their resolution, and never, under the influence either of force or enchantment, forget or cast off their sense of duty to the state. How cast off? he said. I will explain to you, I replied. A resolution may go out of a man's mind either with his will or against his will with his will when he gets rid of a falsehood and learns better, against his will whenever he is deprived of a truth. I understand, he said, the willing loss of a resolution, the meaning of the unwilling I have yet to learn. Why, I said, do you not see that men are unwillingly deprived of a good and willingly of an evil? Is not to have lost the truth an evil, and to possess the truth a good? and you would agree that to conceive things as they are is to possess the truth? Yes, he replied, I agree with you in thinking that mankind are deprived of truth against their will. And is not this involuntary deprivation caused either by theft or force or enchantment? Still, he replied, I do not understand you. I fear that I must have been talking darkly, like the tragedians. I only mean that some men are changed by persuasion, and that others forget. Argument steals away the hearts of one class and time of the other, Then this I call theft. Now you understand me? Yes. Those again who are forced are those whom the violence of some pain or grief compels to change their opinion. I understand, he said, and you are quite right and you would also acknowledge that the enchanted are those who change their minds either under the softer influence of pleasure or the sterner influence of fear? Yes, he said, everything that deceives may be said to enchant. Therefore, as I was just now saying, we must inquire who are the best guardians of their own conviction that what they think the interest of the state is to be the rule of their lives. We must watch them from their youth upwards, and make them perform actions in which they are most likely to forget or to be deceived. And he who remembers and is not deceived is to be selected, and he who fails in the trial is to be rejected. That will be the way. Yes. And there should also be toils and pains and, and conflicts prescribed for them, in which they will be made to give further proof of the same qualities. Very right, he replied. And then, I said, we must try them with enchantments, that is the third sort of test, and see what will be their behaviour, like those who take colts amid noise and tumults to see if they are of a timid nature. So must we take our youth amid terrors of some kind, and again pass them into pleasures, and prove them more thoroughly than gold is proved in a furnace, that we may discover whether they are armed against all enchantments, and of a noble bearing always, good guardians of themselves and of the music which they have learned, and retaining under all circumstances a rhythmical and harmonious nature, such as will be most serviceable to the individual and to the state. And he who at every age, as boy and youth, and in mature life, has come out of the trial victorious and pure, shall be appointed a ruler and guardian of the state. He shall be honoured in life and death, and shall receive sepulture and other memorials of honour, the greatest that we have to give. But him who fails we must reject. I am inclined to think that this is the sort of way in which our rulers and guardians should be chosen and appointed. I speak generally, and not with any pretension to exactness. And speaking generally, I agree with you, he said. And perhaps the word guardian in the fullest sense ought to be applied to this higher class only, who preserve us against foreign enemies and maintain peace among our citizens at home, that the one may not have the will or the others the power to harm us. The young men whom we before called guardians may be more properly designated auxiliaries and supporters of the principles of the rulers. I agree with you, he said. How, then, may we devise one of these needful falsehoods of which we lately spoke, 
just one royal lie which may deceive the rulers, if that be possible, and at any rate the rest of the city. What sort of lie? he said. Nothing new, I replied. Only an old Phoenician tale of what has often occurred before now in other places, as the poets say and have made the world believe, though not in our time. And I do not know whether such an event could ever happen again, or could now even be made probable, if it did. How your words seem to hesitate on your lips. You will not wonder, I replied, at my hesitation when you have heard. Speak, he said, and fear not. Well, then, I will speak, although I really know not how to look you in the face, or in what words to utter the audacious fiction, which I propose to communicate gradually, first to the rulers, then to the soldiers, and lastly to the people. They are to be told that their youth was a dream, and the education and training which they received from us an appearance only. In reality, during all that time, they were being formed and fed in the womb of the earth, where they themselves and their arms and appurtenances were manufactured. When they were completed, the earth, their mother, sent them up, and so, their country being their mother and also their nurse, they were bound to advise for her good and to defend her against attacks, and her citizens they are to regard as children of the earth and their own brothers. You had good reason, he said, to be ashamed of the lie which you were going to tell. True, I replied, but there is more coming. I have only told you half. Citizens, we shall say to them in our tale, you are brothers, yet God has framed you differently. Some of you have the power of command, and in the composition of these he has mingled gold, wherefore also they have the greatest honour. Others he has made of silver, to be auxiliaries. Others again, who are to be husbandmen and craftsmen, he has composed of brass and iron, and the species will generally be preserved in the children. But as all are of the same original stock, a golden parent will sometimes have a silver son, or a silver parent a golden son. And God proclaims as a first principle to the rulers, and above all else, that there is nothing which they should so anxiously guard, or of which they are to be such good guardians as the purity of the race. They should observe what elements mingle in their offspring. For if the son of a golden or silver parent has an admixture of brass and iron, then nature orders a transposition of ranks, and the eye of the ruler must not be pitiful towards the child because he has to descend in the scale and become a husbandman or artisan, just as there may be sons of artisans who have an admixture of gold or silver in them are raised to honour and become guardians or auxiliaries. For an oracle says that when a man of brass or iron guards the state, it will be destroyed. Such is the tale. Is there any possibility of making our citizens believe in it? Not in the present generation, he replied. There is no way of accomplishing this, but their sons may be made to believe in the tale, and their sons' sons, and posterity after them. I see the difficulty, I replied yet the fostering of such a belief will make them care more for the city and for one another. Enough, however, of the fiction, which may now fly abroad upon the wings of rumour, while we arm our earth-born heroes and lead them forth under the command of their rulers. Let them look round and select a spot whence they can best suppress insurrection, if any prove refractory within, and also defend themselves against enemies, who, like wolves, may come down on the fold from without. There let them encamp, and when they have encamped, let them sacrifice to the proper gods and prepare their dwellings. Just so, he said. And their dwellings must be such as will shield them against the cold of winter and the heat of summer. I suppose you mean houses, he replied. But yes, I said, but they must be houses of soldiers and not of shopkeepers. What is the difference? he said. That I will endeavour to explain, I replied. To keep watchdogs who, from want of discipline or hunger or some evil habit or other, would turn upon the sheep and worry them, and behave not like dogs but wolves, would be a foul and monstrous thing in a shepherd. Truly monstrous, he said. And therefore every care must be taken that our auxiliaries, 
being stronger than our citizens, may not grow to be too much for them, and become savage tyrants instead of friends and allies. Yes, great care should be taken. And would not a really good education furnish the best safeguard? But they are well educated already, he replied. I cannot be so confident, my dear Glaucon, I said. I am much more certain that they ought to be, and that true education, whatever that may be, will have the greatest tendency to civilize and humanize them in their relations to one another, and to those who are under their protection. Very true, he replied. Not only their education, but their habitations, and all that belongs to them, should be such as will neither impair their virtue as guardians, nor tempt them to prey upon the other citizens. Any man of sense must acknowledge that. He must. Then, now let us consider what will be their way of life, if they are to realize our idea of them. In the first place, none of them should have any property of his own, beyond what is absolutely necessary. Neither should they have a private house or store closed against any one who has a mind to enter. The provisions should be only such as are required by trained warriors, who are men of temperance and courage. They should agree to receive from the citizens a fixed rate of pay, enough to meet the expenses of the year and no more, and they will go to mess and live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver we will tell them that they have from God. The diviner metal is, the diviner metal is within them and they have therefore no need of the dross which is current among men, and ought not to pollute the divine by any such earthly admixture. For that commoner metal has been the source of many unholy deeds, but their own is undefiled, and they alone of all the citizens may not touch or handle silver or gold, or be under the same roof with them, or wear them, or drink from them. And this will be their salvation, and they will be the saviors of the state. But should they ever acquire homes or lands or monies of their own, they will become housekeepers and husbandmen instead of guardians, enemies and tyrants instead of allies of the other citizens. Hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against, they will pass their whole life in much greater terror of internal rather than external enemies. And the hour of ruin, both to themselves and to the rest of the state, will be at hand. For all which reasons may we not say that thus shall our state be ordered, and that these shall be the regulations appointed by us for guardians concerning their houses and all their matters? Yes, said Glaucon. End of Book Three